up the subject tonight, eschatology study number 39, Revelation chapter 14. And again, we're getting in this half of the book, wherein things is not in chronological order, as you've heard me say in past Bible studies that Revelation chapter 1 through 11 are and events happen in chronological order. Uh, but from chapter 12 throughout, especially chapter 19 and 20, uh, things is not necessarily in chronological order. And the reason being is because Revelation chapter 13 through 19 and 20 is an in-depth study of Revelation chapter 6 through 11, which is the great tribulation period. And, you know, who knows why God chose to have this book written in that manner, but he did. And we certainly don't question God how that he has had it uh, written, that we might study it. But that is what has happened. As we study chapter 11, we know that the things that he described that happened in chapter 11, that the end came in chapter 11. Even it makes reference to the 1,000-year millennial reign with Jesus Christ on earth, which happens immediately after the seven years of great tribulation, in which we have not entered into yet. And we know by study, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, that the next thing prophetically to happen is the rapture of the church. And it happens in that chronological order, the rapture. Then the revelation of the Antichrist, Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Then the great tribulation period, Revelation 6, 1 and 2 through uh, chapter 11. Then it ends and concludes there. Chapter 12, then he begins to uh, speak of things that happened millions of years ago, as in reference to the war that was in heaven between uh, the dragon and his angels and Michael and his angels. And then on in through chapter 13 that we studied in our last Bible study, which again is the revelation of the Antichrist, which has already happened in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And as I made the point in our last study, there's certainly not two Antichrists coming. So we know by that that chapters 13 throughout 19 and 20 is an in-depth study of chapter 6 through 11. And we'll again see that in chapter 14 as we get ready to go into this chapter that is not necessarily in chronological order. And that's one of the things that I think uh, confuses some Bible prophecy teachers is that they have not broken down the book in that order. They have not divided the book up in that order. And if they would and understand that that it is broken up that way, that chapter 11 ends the book, then because what they do, they go on into chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, and then they begin to put in things uh, out of its chronological order, and then they're mixed up. That's why you have some teachers teaching right now that some of the seven seals are open. They're teaching that now. Uh, there are also others that are teaching that some of the trumpets have been blown. Not all of them, but some of them. And those trumpets were not sounded until the seventh seal was open, and that seventh seal contained those seven angels with those seven trumpets. And, and once you study this book as it is laid out correctly, then you can get the proper and correct interpretation of it where a lot of people miss by not understanding how that the book is laid out. It certainly does matter how any book is laid out, even in any study that we do, whether it's Bible prophecy or water baptism or the Godhead, you still have to go into the book and find out the general layout in order to understand it. So getting right on into the night subject, verse 1 of chapter 14. And the Bible says, and I look, and of course we know that this is John writing, the Apostle John. He said, and I look, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And when you read of the word Zion, S-I-O-N, it's the same as Zion 
in the Old Testament, Sion and Sion. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their heads. And of course, we explained that, that it's not a literal name and written in the foreheads of this hundred and forty four thousand. But it is the revelation to the Jewish instructors who Jesus is, and we have already called it that. So we know again that this is another biblical proof that chapter 14 has already happened in this book. It happened, I think, in Revelation chapter 7, when the 144,000 were sealed in their foreheads, given the revelation of who Jesus was, that they might instruct the nation of Israel not to receive the mark of the beast. So again, it is absolutely true that chapters 13 and 14 have already come to pass in this book in chapter 6 and chapter 7. That is easy to determine. If one will study this book slowly and carefully, this great book of Revelation, it is a great book. If one will just study it and slow down and lay it out, then they can get that understanding. But again, for some other reason, uh, people will read this book and they'll get the idea that it's in chronological order from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 22. And that everything from chapter 1, 2, 3, right on through 22, is always something different and something that is yet to come. And it is just not the way this book is laid out. But our first question in verse 1 and understanding verse 1 is, who is this Lamb? And of course, everybody knows who the Lamb of God is. But for Scripture's sake and the study's sake, we go to St. John chapter 1, verse 29 through 32. The identity of the Lamb. The next day, John seeth Jesus. So then we see the this, that Jesus Christ is that Lamb. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. That proves that Jesus was God. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. So, if Jesus is not God, how could he have been before John the Baptist. The only way that he could have been was being God. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest or revealed to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And we know that John the Baptist introduced, was the first to introduce water baptism. And he did it for the remission of sins. Now, that was good for a period of approximately three years, uh, John's baptism. But we learned in our studies in and on the subject of baptism that John's baptism wasn't any good once the church was established because um, Paul ran into some fellows, I believe, in Acts chapter 19. And he asked them, how were they baptized? And they said, according to John's baptism. He said, surely John baptized with water for the remission of sin. And then he told them about baptism in Jesus' name and rebaptized. I believe there was 12 of them, every one of them, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove in a bowl on him. So we know by those scriptures, and there are certainly others, that Revelation 14, 1, the Lamb is Jesus Christ, being revealed to the nation of Israel, which is the subject, the central subject of this book of Revelation, the nation of Israel and their Messiah, that they were responsible for crucifying some 2,000 years ago. Our second question concerning this verse, is who are those or these 144,000 seen with Jesus in heaven? Now, notice we'll go to Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 through 8. But now these 144,000 are in heaven with Jesus.
Jesus. Revelation 7, 1 through 8. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And of course, this is the wrath of God being poured out during the time of great tribulation in which he halted it momentarily. And there was a reason. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom he was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed at 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So we learned by that verse that these are Jews. We learned that it is the same 144,000 that we're reading in chapter 14, again telling us that it's speaking of the same event in general which has already happened. And then he begins to list where these 12,000 are from. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Aser were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephilim were 12,000. Uh, of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Back to verse 1 of chapter 14. So again, uh, just explaining in depth, discerning the Lamb, the 144,000, they're now uh, in this particular passage caught up in the heaven, which tells us that these 144,000 will be saved and certainly will. And not only them, but to them that they are trying to reach. And their sole purpose was, was to minister to the nation of Israel. And as we'll learn in this chapter, the plan for salvation changed from what we experience now as a church. One must be born again. That's what Jesus said in St. John chapter 3, which means to be baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, to be filled with the Holy Ghost, which is being born again of the Spirit, and to endure unto the end. That's the plan for salvation now. But at the rapture of the church, that plan will cease to exist We'll begin then the seven years of great tribulation, and only Jews will be saved, and there is a different plan now for them to be saved. They won't have to be baptized. They won't have to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. One of the reasons for that is they won't have time to do it. Now we assemble churches. We establish churches. Churches have been established now for 2,000 years. In that day... There's going to be so much chaos, the wrath of God being poured out, Israel running from the Antichrist, that Jesus said, you won't even have time to go in your house to get your stuff. That's how speedily these things are going to happen, let alone go to a church or establish an apostolic church and get baptized in Jesus' name. So it just wasn't or will not be feasible for have the same plan for salvation as we do now. Verse 2 and 3. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with the harps, and they sung as it were a new song. But as it were a new song. Not necessarily that it is a new song. The bride will sing a new song. But these will sing a song, actually it's not a new song. Before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man can learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth, which are these hundred and forty four thousand Jews. And of course the question is, what is that song? Revelation chapter 15, verse 2 and 3. Will tell us the song, will reveal the song. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. See, there's going to be a people 
that actually gets a victory over the beast. And of course, it is one, this 144,000. Number two, it's going to be the Jewish nation of Israel. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. But now we have read where all of them don't get the victory. That there are some of them that the beast overcomes them. And then, of course, they lose their lives. And over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses. That's the song. That's the new song that is referenced in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 14. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And you can go back even into the time of Moses and the children of Israel when they crossed the Red Sea and they got on the other side. And Miriam, the sister of Moses, led them in a worship song and they sung the song of Moses, which consists of exalting God for their victory. Same song here in Revelation chapter 15 and Revelation chapter 14, verse 3. The song of Moses is that new song. Back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 4 and 5. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth are found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne. Now, of course, the question in, in these verses is, what was meant by the term, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins? This, again, as we've taught, in order to understand this great book of Revelation, we must understand that everything that is written is not written literally. That it's not to be taken literally. Uh, that some things are written figuratively, symbolically. And this is such a verse. This verse is not to be taken literally as in uh, that they were virgins and that they had not known women. That's not what this means. It's talking spiritually. And in order to get an understanding of what it was talking about when it says that uh, they were virgins and had not known women, let us go to Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 and 2. And we'll see the same phraseology used that we can gain understanding of what is meant in verse 4 and 5. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying, unto me, come hither. I will shew unto thee the great judge, the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Verse 2 is where we get the understanding of what we have just read in chapter 14. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. This is not a natural fornication. It's not talking about natural fornication. As in a sexual relation, it's talking about Spiritual fornication. That's what Israel would often do. Anytime the nation of Israel, who were uh, the servants of the one and true God, worshipped him at his altar, sacrificing to him, would turn and begin to worship as other nations worship, worshiping their gods, such as uh, Moloch and uh, these different types of gods, these false gods and these idols, and begin to worship them, then what they were doing were committing fornication and adultery. But it was spiritual fornication. And such fornication can be committed by the church today by simply bowing down to the gods of the world, by bowing down to the things of the world, by making gods out of the things of the world, 
And another sure way to commit spiritual fornication is to mix and mingle with false religions and false denominations. That is spiritual fornication. Now, the kings of the earth here in chapter 17 will commit fornication with that great whore, which they'll begin to uh, mix and mingle with both beasts. The beast of Revelation 13 and 1, the political antichrist, and the beast of 13 and 11, which is the religious beast, these kings of the earth will commit, meaning they will conjoin with them and take part in their business as in the political movement with the Antichrist and even in the worship aspect of the beast and worshiping, therefore they're committing spiritual fornication. So back to Revelation 14. So what it is saying is about these 144,000 that they won't fall into the trap of spiritual fornication. That they will keep themselves pure from what the Antichrist has to offer, what the religious prophet has to offer. They will not accept the mark of the beast. They will not fall in line with worldly worship when a one world religion is established and all the religions will come together as one. All the denominations that we have in the United States will come together as one. And there will be a one world order, both politically under the Antichrist and religiously under the false prophet. And the world will move to that with the exception of the nation of Israel. These 144,000 instructors, the scriptures have said, will not commit this fornication. In fact, they will instruct the nation of Israel. They will not commit spiritual fornication and receive the mark of the beast. And to receive that mark means they will begin to worship. Remember we studied how that the false prophet would cause an image to be created to the political beast, the Antichrist, and that the world would begin to worship that beast. And the um, false prophet would have the power to make that image both live and speak, the Bible says, and he will have the power to call fire down from heaven in the sight of men. And that they will, they will just for sure begin to believe, perhaps, that the Antichrist perhaps is the Messiah. And then, of course, this false prophet, he must be of God. For who can do these things that he does as in bringing fire down from heaven? Because it's just the nature of man, especially Gentiles, that they, they, they want to see something. Man wants to see something. Signs. We don't, we don't want to walk by faith as commanded us by Paul that we walk by faith and not by sight. But it's much easier to walk by sight. Is that not true? I mean, if you can see something, the Bible says it's no more faith. Sometimes it's hard to have faith. Sometimes it's hard to believe that God's going to work out a situation in your life and it's, it's, you know things is bad. And it's really going to take a miracle to, for that to be worked out. And that's where faith comes in. And we must walk by faith and not beside. That's why I say often that there's great faith in this building tonight. There really is. Because you all have gathered together approximately 2,000 years after the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified, laid in a tomb for three days and three nights, rose again on the third day, and you all actually believe that. You do. And you, you, you prove that you believe that by coming out here tonight to hear His Word taught, to be in His service, and that is an act of faith. And I've often said that there is great faith today. Now, it is true, we're not seeing the miracles today as in healings and blinded eyes open and the dead being raised and things of that nature. 
as they experienced 2,000 years ago. But there is great faith. Because many of those people saw Jesus. I mean, they saw him and was among the thousands that saw him take two fishes and five loaves and feed thousands of people and kept breaking it and breaking it and breaking it until all was fed and saw that there was 12 baskets full left over. They saw him, the twelve did, walk on water. They saw him, above 500 saw him after his death, his crucifixion. They saw him after that third day. He appeared to above 500 witnesses for 40 days and 40 nights. He did. So, we today have assembled together 2,000 years later still believing what is written in this book, that all of those things actually happen. And I believe it, don't you? I believe That's why that I'm here tonight. That's why that I'm afraid to go back out in the world. I'll be honest with you. I honestly, I'm afraid to go back out there. Because I believe with all of my heart this Bible is true. And if I would let my flesh rule me, then it would drive me back out into the world. But there's something down inside me, there's a fear of that. Because I know and I believe with all my heart this Bible is real. And that there is a hell that has been prepared. But if I believe Jesus rose again from the dead, according to this Bible, This same Bible says he went into the heart of the earth and preached to the souls that was in prison there, which is hell. So I believe the whole book. And I believe that if I were to go back out into the world and either the Lord were to come or catch me out there in that backslid condition, then that's where I'm going. It's to that prison house. And I don't want to go there. And I have a great enough fear of going to hell That, along with loving the Lord, loving the worship of the Lord, keeps me in the house of God. You see, we all get discouraged and we all get down and out. And we all, to tell the truth about it, sometimes just feel like throwing up both hands and quitting. No, we all do. When things don't go right, everything's going wrong, we're we're disheartened and discouraged. And, and, and sometimes the devil all at the same time talking to our minds and said, it'd be much easier if you would just quit. And then we begin to think about, well, maybe, well, just maybe it would. And then when I get to thinking along those lines, then I start thinking about hell. And so, no, didn't go that way. <laughs> it's going to be much harder to endure hell then it ever will be to endure what we may have to go through in this life. And because of that fear in part, keeps me in the house of the Lord. It keeps me in check. You know, you, you begin to see the things of the world, and the devil begins to point out things of the world to you that, that we have to deny ourselves from in this Christian walk with God. He said, man, how great that would be. But you can't go to church and do both. You've got to pick one or the other. Then the old flesh always wants to pick that out to us, but we can't do that. Then I begin to think, is there anything in the world worth going to hell for? I've weighed it in the balances, and I have found that there is nothing out in the world worth going to hell for. And I just simply don't want to go. And that's why I say that there is great faith among God's people. And there are apostolic churches all over this planet with apostolic people just like us, assembled together, that's never saw him, never heard him with audible voice, believe that these things are real, just like we do. And they're hanging on because they don't want to go to hell either. And even though we are small in number, as in comparison to the worldly church, there are still a lot of apostolic people out of this 7 billion people. We're not the majority by no means, but there's still a lot of us. And there's going to be quite a few people missing when the rapture takes place. 
back to Revelation 14 and 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Now, this everlasting gospel is not this new birth that we are experiencing. It's not. And some get confused. I've heard preachers preach about this everlasting gospel, and it's what we're experiencing now. It's not. The everlasting gospel. Understand that he's speaking of a time, and the period of time that he's speaking is the great tribulation period. So, even though it is referred to as the everlasting gospel, that the reason for that is because all people from Adam to the last one that will be saved in the great tribulation will be covered under the gospel because everybody's got to be saved by the blood. But there's different plans in which the blood is applied to Moses and the children of Israel is obeying the law and Every male child being circumcised. To us, it's being baptized in water and being filled with the Holy Ghost. But in the Great Tribulation period, it's going to be a different plan. But it's all the same blood. So it has to be the same gospel, but a different plan. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, speaking during the time of the Great Tribulation, and to every nation and kindred and people and tongue. Now, people read this and get confused. Well, that must mean Gentiles too. Absolutely not. Then you have to go back in depth and study and find out the only people, the only nation of people that was ever referred to as a number which no man can number that come up out of every nation on the earth. And that is only the nation of Israel in which we have studied in depth in previous study. Verse 7 saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. That tells us it's the great tribulation period. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. See, this group of people that He's speaking to now is Jews. They know all about the God of all creation, the God of Genesis 1 and 1, because the Jews believe that part of the Bible. They just don't believe the New Testament part of the Bible now, for they are blinded. But uh, the question in these two verses is, of course, what is meant by this everlasting gospel? And again, uh, it is the gospel that spans from Adam in the garden to the last one that will be saved in the great tribulation period. Uh, Because all... It's covered by the same blood. When Jesus shed his blood on Calvary, it wasn't only for the sins of everybody that committed sin after he died, but it went in reverse for all the sins of the world all the way back to Adam. That's how that worked. The next question is, what is meant by this everlasting gospel? Or what would be different to these people than to us, the church today? And I want to tell you what the plan is. Joel chapter 2, 27 through 32. Joel here in chapter 2 is clearly speaking of the end time, the great tribulation period concerning the nation of Israel. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. Now we know up until verse 29 that it is a direct reference to Acts chapter 2. Wherein the baptism of the Holy Ghost was given as part of the new birth of St. John chapter 3 for the new established church that was established in Acts chapter 2 by the preaching of Simon Peter. 
uh, commissioned by Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, and Luke chapter 24. Now, this is a twofold prophecy both to the church. That is one plan. This plan is not for the tribulation saints in the time of great tribulation. Now, verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness. When does that happen? I mean, it happened on the day of Pentecost, did it? So we know that there is a great major difference in who he is addressing in verse 30 and 31, or 31, then when he was making that direct reference to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Talking to two completely different people because of the information that we can glean in verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. When does that happen? In the time of great tribulation. Before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass. Now here is the plan for salvation for Jewish people. The 144,000 that were sealed in the forehead. And the nation of Israel that gets victory over the beast, even through death, this is the plan that they will have to follow in order to be saved. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That is the simple plan. All those people will have to do, the Jewish nation of Israel, when as the old phrase is, all hell breaks loose in the time of great tribulation, which is midway through. We know by study that the seven years of great tribulation is divided up into two parts, 1,260 days, four times, times, and a half a time, or three and a half years, two segments of three and a half years. The first three and a half years in which the Antichrist is revealed, he comes in on a peace platform. We studied that. He brings peace and prosperity to the world. He brings peace to the Middle East. He will make everybody get along for three and a half years. And it will be so great that the nation of Israel will completely let down their defenses. Now they are well able to protect themselves from any nation in the Middle East. For the first coming today, they're going to drop down their walls. The Bible refers to it, unwalled cities. We studied that in those. That's why you've got, to, you've got to study Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and these walled cities of Jericho to understand what walled cities and unwalled cities mean. You've got to study the book of Joshua and know that when Joshua went into Jericho, that the city was mighty, but it was mighty because it had a double wall about it and what that wall represents. And then by knowing that and having that knowledge of Scripture, when it is made reference to Israel at the time of the end, being a city of unwalled, or unwalled, meaning they drop their defenses because walls was a defensive mechanism that they would set their gates and they could stand up on the wall and they could fire down at their enemies and very seldom could one penetrate those walls. And the only way that Joshua could penetrate the walls of Jericho was to march around them seven days and on the seventh day seven times and go in order that God gave and blow the trumpet and the walls God made to fall down flat and then they went over in. So understand there's so much one has to know. There's so much one has to study in order before they ever get to the book of Revelation so we can understand these mysteries of Genesis and Exodus and Joshua and Judges and so on and so forth. And it shall come to pass that who serves shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. When 1260 days expires. It'll be during that time that Magog marches on Israel, who is Russia. The Antichrist 
gaining control of the West, drives Russia out of Israel, goes in there, gets his eye on the temple, enters into the temple, commands that Israel worship him as God. They refuse, and he begins to slaughter them. Jesus makes reference to this very time in Luke chapter 21 and Matthew chapter 24, in which he warns Israel, pray that your flight be not in the winter, for you're going to have to run from your home. Pray that the women are not giving suck in those days because they're going to have to literally, now this is literal, literally flee from their homes from the wrath of this beast, this antichrist, and he will kill thousands of them. And that's why the only plan for salvation is calling on the name of the Lord. And by calling on the name of the Lord, rejecting the beast and his mark, and giving their lives, they will be fulfilling the plan for salvation for the time of great tribulation. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered or saved. The word delivered and saved can be used synonymous one with another. For in Mount Zion... And in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. Now, he's clearly speaking of the great tribulation period. But that's when the moon is turned into blood and darkness and all of that sort of thing. As the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And he will call these people. And their eyes will be opened. And they will receive Jesus Christ as Messiah. Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 through 14. Jesus is referencing the same subject. Now listen. Then shall they deliver you up. Who? Israel. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. Along with them, only having to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, meaning accepting the Lord as Messiah, and whom they rejected. Then when the wrath of the Antichrist is poured out upon them, they will have to endure, and if necessary, give their own lives to be saved. And that's the plan for salvation in the time of great tribulation. I like our plan better, don't you? Water baptism. Three cannons. Water baptism, being filled with the glorious Holy Ghost, with evidence of speaking in other tongues, living a holy and dedicated life before God. I like that plan much better than having my head chopped off. Amen. Surely. So back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Again, it's not natural fornication. It is spiritual fornication. Who would they commit this with? Revelation 13, 1 through 3. Is this Babylon ancient Babylon? No. Now, we know... Babylon exists today. The modern name for it now is Iraq. That's where ancient Babylon was, even during the time of Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein perceived himself as being Nebuchadnezzar. He really did. And he made an attempt, and in some part, to restore the ancient city of Babylon. And of course, uh, then the war came by George Bush and uh, then his government was overthrown 
And then finally, they hunted him down. He was found in a little hole over there. And then eventually they hanged him, uh, sat in the same. But he, he felt that he was somehow Nebuchadnezzar incarnate. He did. He made those statements. And he wanted to restore ancient Babylon to its glory. Because you remember, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was, without a doubt, the most powerful one man on this earth. Uh, never been one as powerful before him. The only one that would be more powerful than him after him would be the Antichrist, who will have that form and fashion about him. But Saddam Hussein wanted to be that man. So it's not ancient Babylon. It is the kingdom of the Antichrist. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a, a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. That are these kingdoms, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Grecian. And the dragon, which is the devil, gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wanted after the beast, and we believe that to be none other than the beast of Daniel, which you saw depicted as a beast with great iron teeth that devoured much flesh, which is none other than the Roman Empire that was in power during the days of Jesus that received a deadly wound, that they lost their power and authority, but they will be revived during the time of great tribulation, ruled by the Antichrist. And I believe that it will be the ancient Roman Empire. And I believe that Catholicism will have much to do with the false prophet that arises and the one world religion. I believe that. And we'll study a little more about that in Revelation, I think, chapter 17, about that woman that is decked with gold and silver, and she rides upon the scarlet-colored beast. I believe Rome is a major participant in this end time, I believe, Rome as a government. Uh, now, when I say Rome as a government, it will consist of ancient Babylon, uh, the Medes and the Persians and Grecian and all of that combined, the Assyrian, the Egyptian, and all that together. Uh, it will be the most powerful force on earth led by Satan ever known in this entire world. And it is yet to come. It is in formation now. I believe this leader, both leaders, both beasts are alive and well now. And they're just out there in the shadows awaiting for themselves to be revealed after the rapture of the church. Back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, whosoever receiveth, the mark of the beast. And of course, these verses reveal that those that follow the beast and take his mark and worship his image will be punished with eternal damnation. So they that receive his mark certainly will receive and die and go to hell. Verses 12 through 16. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And I heard the voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord in his courts, and yea, sense of spirit, that they may rest from their labors and the works be followed them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust ye in thy sickle, and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And of course, again, he's speaking of the time of 
great tribulation, he certainly is. And Israel will be redeemed at the end of the seven years. Sometimes we'll take false out of Revelation and preach it as a second form meaning to the church, as in that there's going to be a harvest of the Gentile bride, certainly, but it's going to be separate from the Jewish nation of Israel. Verse 16, And he, he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. We know that according to Paul, concerning the nation of Israel, he does make this statement, And all Israel shall be saved. And I've heard that debated and spoke about at different times. And does it literally mean every soul in Israel? Or, or just what exactly did he mean? When he said, and all, I believe it's the, the verse is Romans chapter 11, and all Israel shall be saved. Does it mean every single one of them? I'm, I'm really not for sure. I'm for sure about this. They all will have an opportunity to be saved because they was God's chosen, God's ordained elect. Verse 17 through 20. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had his sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrush in thy sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now when you read of the wine press, of the wrath of God, the Lord in pouring out His wrath upon this earth, which He will do uh, during the time of great tribulation, He likens it unto the wine-making process. And we'll see a prophecy that was given. Verse 20 says, And the wine press was trodden without the city. Speaking of the battle of Armageddon. And this wine is blood, the blood of humans that are killed in the battle of Armageddon. And the wine press was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the wine press, even to the horse's bridle, approximately four and a half foot deep, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. So when you read of the wine making process, it is illustrating the anger and the wrath of God being poured out upon this earth. There was a prophecy given in Psalm 75, verses 7 through 10, by the psalmist. Now, notice how this starts out. But God is judge. So we know that he's going to be speaking of judgment, wrath, anger being poured out, lives being lost, people being killed. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. This is not a literal interpretation. It's not to be taken literally by no means. Because the Lord never had a cup of wine in his hand all of the days of his life. Wine is impure. For in the, so there's a spiritual meaning. In fact, there's a prophecy here. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. When you read of wine in the Old Testament, when it speaks as wine being red, it's depict, depicting and illustrating anger and wrath, and destruction. For in the hand of the Lord those cup, and the wine is red, meaning God is going to be more angry at this time than perhaps any time ever in the history of the creation of this planet. In 6,000 years, God will have never been as angry as He will be here in Psalm 75. He said for that, and, and He describes the mixture of this wine. A cup and the wine is red. It is full of mixture or anger. And he poureth out of the same. 
but the dregs thereof. All the wicked of the earth. Now you see that's not talking about a literal cup. And all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. Who drinks this wine? The wicked, not the saints. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. Verse 10. All the horns of the wicked, that's who he's talking about. That's who receives this spiritual wine. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Psalm 75 and 8, when it says, For in the hand of the Lord there is cup and the wine is red, is a direct prophecy of what we have been reading in Revelation chapter 6 through 11 and Revelation chapter 14, the wrath and the anger of God being poured out upon the wicked, symbolized in red wine, and that the wicked drink it. When you study wine in Scripture, most often, fermenting and leaven. Fermenting and leaven, when something is leavened, both are the same processes. The difference between fermentation and leaven, something being leaven, is fermentation deals with liquid and leaven deals with a solid, such as bread. Breads are filled with leaven or yeast that makes it raise. That's why when we take communion, we have unleavened bread. You ever noticed how flat and doughy that it is? Because when it's baked, it's baked, but it has no leaven in it. Therefore, it don't make biscuits, right? That's how you get your biscuits, see. So why wasn't there any leaven in the bread? Because leaven, when you study leaven in Scripture, leaven represents sin. That's why when we take the cup, of grape juice, it's not being fermented. Because fermentation represents sin. It absolutely does. So anything that is fermented is sin, and anything that is leavened is sin, in association with worship. See? And the illustration is plain in Psalm 75 and 8, and Revelation chapter 14, and Revelation chapter 6 through 11, what this is an illustration of. It is God's anger upon wicked people, and truly, wicked people will be destroyed finally, once and for all, in the time of great tribulation, and more than that, after the 1,000-year millennial reign with Jesus Christ. Because some of them escape the seven years of great tribulation, go right on into the 1,000-year millennial reign with Jesus Christ. And, and they live peaceably until the devil is turned loose again and he deceives them once again and he leaves his, uh, leaves his final revolt on the city of God and the people of God at the end of the 1,000 year, year millennial reign and they are once and for all destroyed and uh, the devil is cast into the lake of fire where the Bible says the beast and the false prophet are. The, the beast the Antichrist, and the false prophet, they go to hell after the seven years of great tribulation. The devil joins them after the 1,000 years is expired. And then once that has happened, then all evil is over. It is over forever. The devil will finally, finally the devil will have been defeated. And the people of God will never, ever have to contend with the devil again. He will once and for all be shut up and cast into the lake of fire where he will never escape. And he, with all of those angels that fell with him and all of the wicked of the earth from the time of Adam all the way to the last man that dies and goes to hell, there will be their place of interment 
for all eternity. I don't want to go there, do you? 